I, I think it sounds rather abstract what I'm saying, but I think I'm trying to both hold what I do know about how I might make something as well as hold an open space of what I don't know yet about myself. And it's a little bit, it's fun and confusing. <laughs> Hello, my name is Eline Perez, and you're listening to Are You an Artist? For this episode, I had the chance to interview the great Amy Voris, who also interviewed me, so today is more like a conversation, an exchange around creative practices and life. Amy speaks about creative dance, authentic movement, and the pleasure of watching feminine football. So even if you might hear a bit of background noise, You will find this episode so interesting that you will also want to come to Manchester, meet Amy, move and watch feminine football. Enjoy! I'm curious about what you did on the journey up, if you listened to something or read something or daydreamed out the window, which is my favorite thing to do on a coach. Do you know what I did? What did you do? So first I slept a bit oh, because it was nice. very early yeah, and yeah, I finished yeah, late. Yeah. And then I um, I read your PhD. What? <laughs> I started to read it. What? <laughs> because I was... Oh I, my God. I wanted to do it before. And, but I don't know. Sometimes I'm not very good at organizing myself and I didn't find the time. And then I was like, ah, I want to start reading it though because like probably it will inform me a bit more. I had to look at your website before, but... Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. But then at some point you, you're like, you need to read it slow. So I was like, okay. <laughs> and then I was like, at some point I was tired. So I was like, just allow yourself to like, so I, and I, I was until the middle somewhere. And then okay. I just listened to a bit of music, looked at the window and that wow. was it. Oh my gosh. Wow. <laughs> I wasn't expecting you to say that. That's for sure. <laughs> But I kind of really enjoyed reading a bit of it. it was, oh. Yeah, because I'm, I'm in the process of maybe creating a, a solo or something. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I was like, actually, this is the kind of stuff I need to read mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to find how. Mm -hmm. Because we don't talk that much about kind of how to... How to make solo, yeah. solo work. And if, have you made solo work before? So I made one when I was, so I didn't want to pick choreography in, last, in my last year in Laban because I did it in second year and it was a bit of a disaster for me because I was involved in so many projects. So, okay. and I remember I had this conversation with Marina mm. and uh, she told me, are you going to pick it for third year? And I said, no, nah, no, I don't think it's for me. It's too hard. <laughs> and she was like, sometimes it's good to push where it hurts. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't, this didn't make me choose the model, but then I had another friend who told me, ah, it's good, you can create a solo that then you can present for auditions. So I picked it last minute, I was like, okay, I'll do it. Mm. And then I, I didn't know how to, I wanted to do a solo, but I didn't know how to, and I, I had Heidi as my tutor. And I remember I was really in a phase where I was really kind of sad about I, I was not happy in Laban. I was, I felt stuck. I couldn't explore my creativity. Mm -hmm. And I told Heidi, I was like, I don't think I will do it. I have no idea. I don't know how to do it. And then I was like, ah, I think this BA is not for me. And she was like, you could stop. And I never had someone just telling me that. I don't know, it was just a push I needed. And then I did this solo that was very, it just came to me. Like mm -hmm. I didn't have to do very much. And then it was selected to be on stage and then it made really, it made people laugh. It made people react to it. It was so powerful. And I was like, wow. But also I think that's what terrified me. And that's why I didn't do anything else after. Okay. Because it was so much more than I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. So that's why now I'm a bit like, oh, mm -hmm. but I still want to do it. So Yeah. You feel ready now yeah, to, to just yeah. do something. Mm, oh, that sounds exciting. Yeah. Because you've done some quite a bit of solo work, haven't you? I am drawn to making solo work. And I'm drawn to, to working on solos in quite a slow 
way, like mm-hmm. sort of slow cooking way. I saw that, yeah, your first one was a couple of years. Yeah. And I think um, I'm sort of drawn to that way of working. Part It's partly a temperamental, you mm. know, personality thing. Like I just like to take time with things. And it's also partly a practical thing because generally speaking, my like artistic creative practice, uh, whatever we want to call it, <laughs> um, movement practice, let's say, it happens alongside other work, like on the side, it's happening on the side. And so it is sort of turned into a kind of lifelong project of making work that can happen within and alongside everything else in life. I really like that. Um, because it's sustainable, but it also suits me temperamentally. And I like to hang out with things for a long time and kind of look at it from lots of perspectives and feel different things. And it's just sort of what's happened. And I stand by it in the sense that it works for me, but you know, it doesn't work for everyone, that style of making. And it's not, uh, you know, it doesn't fit into some structures yeah. um, of programming or Residences funding and, and things like that. Yeah. I mean, you can make, you can work it out, you know, and configure it so that it does sometimes. But mostly I find myself just get, kind of getting on with it alongside other things. You know? <laughs> it's, it's fine. I'm, ha- I'm happy with that. Happy enough anyway. How about you? How do you tend to work? Well, when you're making something. I think that will probably be the case for that solo because I wanted to do it for a bit now, but it helps me to have other jobs because I think otherwise I put too much pressure on it also mm-hmm. in a way. And it's, I like being inspired by real things. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I really like working in the bar. And at some point I was also a cleaner. Mm-hmm. And there was something about cleaning people's houses, flats. Mm. so but I I'm very impatient as well so I it's a good it's good when teachers help me to slow down Mm -hmm. and let go Mm -hmm. not try to control too much (laughs) (laughs) it's Mm -hmm. nice yeah yeah and how do you how what's the like portal in if you're making something do you have how does the process begin? How does it continue? Oh, this is really what I'm asking myself at the moment. Um, so I'm I'm practicing more, like every day I'm practicing, and with that in mind that I want to create that solo. So I, I don't mm. think I have probably started. I've written some stuff down. Mm. But it's really coming to me slowly. Like I have this, oh, maybe there's this I could do, or these images... So I'm trying to write them down and I think I would like to set myself maybe a date where, okay, I want to have something and then be able to film it or Mm. so then I can present it to, I don't know, Mm. theaters Mm. or places. Mm. So some kind of like a a bit of a deadline to help organize. Yeah, Yeah, maybe. Yeah, that can be helpful sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Just so I get it done because <laughs> yeah mm. I've written a mm. letter to you really? yeah that's what I do with that podcast oh. <laughs> that also I finished doing in the coach <laughs> so dear Amy I'm so happy to finally meet you in person I remember taking your experiential anatomy classes online during COVID with Charlotte and loving them so much I also remember wanting to book your classes in London last year, but they were all sold out, not a surprise. I have not had the chance to see your creative dance work yet, but I had a look at your website and became even more fascinated by the richness of your practice. You have done so many works, solos, collaborations, creations for performers and students. You have a PhD in philosophy, you also trained in integrative bodywork and movement therapy. So I have many, many, many questions, but I will start with the first one, which is the name of the podcast. 
Are you an artist? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I'm. That's very kind letter you've written. So I'm just taking it in for a minute. That's. I want to return the favor to you and and uh, look at your work and respond to it uh, another time. Um, yes, I think I am an artist, and I think it's part of the fabric of many things that I do. Um, and I feel like I'm still in the process of understanding, you know, who I am and how I work and watching that change as well as I get older and mm. and also not change. I guess some fascinations stick around. Um, When did you start dancing? I mean, I guess it was kind of like, um, I think I always moved around a lot. Um, <laughs> and then my mom, in a kind of classic small town USA way, my, my mom asked I remember I was like five or six. She said, do you want to try some dance classes? And they were sort of like creative ballet classes in the local small town thing. So I went to that. Um, but um, I didn't really do dance seriously. I sort of did classes on and off as a child and as a teenager. Mm. But I discovered contemporary dance or what you call in the U.S. modern dance uh, when I was at university doing a, not studying dance, just studying something else, but you could do something there or you, know, you could have, you could take subjects that were more like elective things alongside your main subject. So I took a class called um, Modern Dance for the Non-Major, which just meant it was like a, a side thing you did wow. three hours. And I met um, through that, I fell in love, first of all, with the art form of, of contemporary or modern dance pretty quickly like I just loved to me at the time how I made sense of it was um, it felt like poetry watching poetry but move and something about that understanding of what I was seeing clicked in my heart mm -hmm. and I, I just loved it and I met a mentor named W. Eric Akins who sadly passed away who ran this like extra uh, this like dance um, group called one nation dance ensemble and we, we participated in his choreographies and he very much encouraged us in like a diy way although i knew really nothing about making choreography apart from what i just you know yeah intuitively did to make our own work and to make our own work around subject matter that was important to us And he was very much into critical pedagogy at the time, which was an educational movement that was uh, like prominent in education departments in the 90s. Okay, what was that about? Critical pedagogy, um, it has a quite complex lineage, which I'm not going to be able to <laughs> fully <laughs> explain, but um, it's kind of about empowering the student to Ooh. direct their own learning and also challenging, challenge power structures yeah. within education. And so the way he embodied that as an educator and as an artist is he trusted us to make our own work. Um, you know, so we just got on with it. And he had many, many skills and was a very talented dancer. He also happened to be a Lavan movement analyst Um, and was passionate about movement as a medium. Mm. He was also a, 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 like a political activist and very politicized. And some, there was something about the way he brought together or he sought to bring together movement-based processes with processes of self-discovery and self-expression and activism all at the same time, which was also part of the you know, wider field of the time in the 90s. Um, And it completely inspired me to want to actually teach dance, to, to Ooh, become a creative dance okay. teacher. And that brought me eventually to, um, to England hmm. to study creative dance with people who taught that 
in different ways, but specifically through the Laban framework. And mm. I was really curious about how to teach improvisation mm. um, and also teach people about their bodies and about movement. Mm. Um, Which you do now. Yes, and that it, yeah, I think it's the same interest that's driven me in mm. a way. Um, yeah, and, but while I went, and so then I, I went to Laban and I studied with Marion Goff, whose books are right up there. Um, important sort of creative dance teacher here and uh, I also decided I wanted to maybe try performing and okay. wanted to explore making work and things so it's sort of lots of things unfolded from there um, but I didn't to come back to the question I really didn't start dancing I think with a kind of serious intent until I was 19 or something like that mm. um, off the back of like you know just having done a lot of different physical things and being drawn to being physical and stuff <laughs> but I wasn't very competitive uh, I wasn't a, a good athlete though I tried lots of sports and I wasn't a very good ballet dancer although I did some and you know you learn things through that but I, I think I found the motivation to learn how to move mm. and learn about movement through that through thanks to W. Eric Aikens and in Oxford, Ohio, he uh, really, truly, his attitude towards dance really changed my life. Um, yeah. How about you? When did you start dancing, or how did how well, did happen for you? Five as well. I think my mom asked me, eh, "There is a dance class. Do you want to go?" And I didn't care, but I think she really wanted me to want to go in order to like put me in the class so yeah but you you can choose really you can do it or not and I'm like yeah okay I'll do it <laughs> yeah this led to doing another ballet class and then uh, starting also jazz hmm. and I really liked my dance school but I was not very good so I really wanted to be a professional dancer but that was not really an option hmm. because I was really working hard and going to the competitions and stuff but hmm. I, w I think my memory is not so good so it would take me longer to learn choreography and then my body wouldn't move in the exact way. And I got a bit frustrated. So, And I had good grades at school. So my parents were like, be a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> but when I was 17, I was like, I think I really want to be not a lawyer mm -hmm. and a dancer. Mm -hmm. So we had a, a, the deal of, okay, you can study law for a year and you can audition for dance schools, but abroad. So you can learn a language. Uh -huh. That's why I auditioned for our lab and in London. Uh -huh. But we didn't. I didn't expect, and I think nobody expected me to be uh, accepted. Because even the audition, I was not so good. When it was time to jump, because I like to jump, I, I, I was like, okay, now jump very high. <laughs> because that's your thing. <laughs> Probably jumped high enough. <laughs> and that's how I went to London, yeah. Mm, <laughs> wow. Mm. And what would you say draws you to, to keep dancing or moving? I think it's the discovery of improvisation mm -hmm. with these teachers at Lab and Marina Collard, Henry Montes, mm. um, and somatic practices as well. Mm. Discovering somatic practices was a very big thing because my body is quite tense and strong and I always had tensions in my shoulders and it was a bit painful to move mm. but with that approach of starting to take more time and lie on the ground I w it would really be such a relief and then I would move in a completely different way and I felt so free mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, every time I was like I want to do it again mm. and yet yeah, this also discovering creation and choreography there was something there. Mm. And now exploring the body keeps me, yeah, I'm very interested how to keep feeling and mm. how to move from there mm. and what's possible. Mm. It was one year for you at Laban. Yes, it was one year and then a second year. Okay. So the first year they they used to have, I don't know if they still have it, it was it was brilliant. It was perfect for what I needed at the time. It was called a professional diploma in dance studies, and you did technique, 
you did choreography and you did choreological studies and you did you could then choose and so I chose these education based subjects and you could you know and do Pilates um with like Susanna Lahusen I don't know if she's still she's she's uh, she worked with Pilates but also ex- sort of wove in other things so I was could feel my body in her sessions and, mm. and you could also audit I audited like a MA history and an undergrad like course on dance politics or something like that Ooh. you know so I sat oh wow because I was quite hungry to learn in in you know in Different also way. yeah and yeah. study dance history and all this stuff that I hadn't done so I just really wanted to, to download <laughs> as much as possible really- <laughs> so I was like just there and then of course actually that that program I mean there was there was great teachers but also it was like the peers that I met uh, who mm-hmm. were on that one-year program really changed my life. And one whom I, I really specifically want to mention is a woman named Regula Fergaline, who is uh, a Swiss dance artist um, and also a dance movement therapist um, and also a, a practicing speech therapist. And at the time, she had done quite a lot more dance than I had, contemporary dance. And she was extre- extremely gifted mover and very perceptive, intelligent woman. Um, and she went on to study dance movement, what we would now call dance movement psychotherapy at Laban. But anyway, I learned so much from just hanging around her that year. And she later introduced me because we then ended up, she moved back to Switzerland eventually, but we ended up in the early 2000s. I think it was around then we had some collaborations Mm. between us and she also makes solo work. And she introduced me to this practice, which is confusingly called authentic movement, a sort of contemplative (laughs) practice. So that was at the time when you were in Laban that you discovered authentic movement? No, it was later, later, Mm. yeah, later through, through regular. Um, And then I went on to do this somatic movement therapy training with, with Linda Hartley and authentic movement was part of that program and... I had another, I have an ongoing love affair with that practice now. <laughs> yeah, I, I also in the PhD. <laughs> yes, but uh, it's it's so really much. turn it into a lifelong project. It's, it's so funny thing. because I have like my questions and there is one is just authentic movement yes. because I'm like, we need to talk about it. <laughs> we need to talk about it. Yes, yes, yes. So I think that practice, you know, yeah, it opened up a lot of things for me so but I, I do want to credit regular for introducing me to that practice um yeah and and the other people during that one year course who and other people at lab and then i then went out went on to collaborate with or mm-hmm. dance the dance for or you know it really was as much about the fellow artists <laughs> who you know were emerging artists as it was about going to you know being taught things you know so yeah. I think that's something that continues for me. Is like, I just feel like I learn so much from the people I encounter mm. um, and collaborate with. And so that's like alongside the solo practice or these collaborative practices that I'm involved with that are like so formative, you mm. know. And just after the training, did you already like go straight into, okay, I'm staying in London and I'm starting to create, collaborate and everything? So I stayed for another year okay. at Laban and was lucky to be able to do that. And I sort of did some community studies courses and I started an MA. Yeah, oh, straight uh, after. I started, I did one MA module and then I wanted to stay. And I was also fortunate to be, to step into some working opportunities. I, mm. I taught in schools. I taught, okay. I taught teenagers wow. uh, after school clubs and stuff. And I loved it. Mm. And I really thought, and I taught children as well. Like there were different opportunities to teach in school at that time. And this is the nineties, you know, mm. mid to late nineties. Probably there still are those opportunities, but you know, that was so, I was so passionate about it. It felt like a dream come true that I could try out teaching creative dance. So. So I was doing that, and I was also dedicating a lot of time to dancing with a dance company called Rosa's Thoughts. Mm. 
um, with a choreographer named Ruth Sagalis and a, a, a another performer, fellow dancer, Natasha Gilmore. And we did that for about seven years. Um, and, you know, like I said, I sort of was always teaching uh, mm. alongside it. And then I started to, I continued my MA and did that. So all of those things were kind of weaving mm -hmm. together. Um, That's why I really loved your website because you can really see yeah, there's so much, but I think because you were doing all these things kind of, yeah, at the same time and, and it's just, and it's all connected as well. Yeah, it's just, uh, I'm just sort of, thank, <laughs> thank you for these questions. I'm just remembering, yeah, they're so like, I think it's it's so wonderful to be able to like work as a facilitator, educator, work in that way alongside making and performing because you learn so much hmm. about the medium. You know, I just couldn't get enough of it all. And it's also, you know, the teaching work is a way to make a living. Um, mm -hmm. But I also take a, a sort of steep intake of breath because sometimes it can feel like trying to do too many things at <laughs> once. So yeah. I think the, which is something that a lot of people know, first full stop, a lot of artists know, a lot of dancers know. So this, I think sometimes this like how to get the balance right. And do you have like things that you do when you notice that it's too much? Do you take a break or do you... Nowadays, I didn't used to do this. I would just work every day of the week, you know, all the time. Mm. But nowadays, life has sort of asked me to slow down a bit mm. more. And I try to... This is on a good day. <laughs> <laughs> I try to ask myself, what's most important right now? Uh -huh. And let, you know, give what's most important my time and attention. Um, And that means toning down the effort sometimes that's put into some things and toning up the effort that's put into other things that matter and just trying to, to figure that out. Uh, but that's an ongoing inquiry. But yeah, getting the balance right. So if something feels a bit off, I sort of ask myself like, okay, what's needed? What's missing? Sometimes there's just too much going on mm. and you, that you have to kind of that asks for something else, like how to move through it um, yeah, with okay. as much intelligence that is, you know, <laughs> mind, <laughs> which is sometimes not much. You know. <laughs> it's, a, it's like, I think if I look at things like this is a learning process, then I, I can sort of receive what's, receive a lot of things, what's happening, you know, but... Uh, Yeah, it's hard. I don't know what I'm saying. What about mm. you? How do you manage doing lots of different things all at once? I don't. <laughs> I I don't know. Sometimes I just don't think enough, I think, and I just plan my week and I say yes to everything. And then I look at my schedule and I'm like, wow. Mm. But also I feel like I can find a lot of space in some of my jobs. Mm -hmm. Like when I work at the bar, sometimes we have long breaks where people are in the theater, so we don't do anything. Yeah. And it's actually very refreshing to just laugh with the people. About mm -hmm. And it's a very good people there also at Wilton's. Mm -hmm. They're very funny, mm -hmm. like actors or mm -hmm. creative people, and they don't take themselves seriously. So mm -hmm. it's playful. But yeah, sometimes... I think it's because I need to sleep good eight to nine hours. And for me, it's more when I f don't have that time to sleep mm. that I'm not so good. Mm -hmm. I get mm. in a bad mood and I, I get become very French. <laughs> <laughs> Angry at everything and even the things I've chosen. I'm like, why? <laughs> <laughs> But it's, I feel like it's easier when it's sunny. I like to sit in the sun and this brings me a lot mm. of energy so mm. but i can't control the weather so no hmm and going forward how would you like it to be for you in terms of 
what you where you give what you give your energy to i mean now i'm already a bit better at finding time for like just practicing which i i didn't have the time before but now i'm trying to make it slowing down and also i'm trying to be a I've realized that I buy food, you know, straight from the supermarket and it's all, all, all packed in plastic and things. And I would like to maybe reduce my waste and find more time to make a salad and put it in my Tupperware and all those things. A life, lifestyle. Just slowing down everything, even the traveling, if I can travel by coach or by train and not fly. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All those things. Mm. And why did you want to do that PhD? Why? Yeah. <laughs> Because you were already having all these creative practices and... Mm. I like that, that question, why? Um, I think um, it was like quite, there was quite like, it was quite multi-stranded, my motivations for doing it um, and multi-layered. One reason was to kind of rededicate myself to my own movement practice and it turned out to be about a solo dance making practice but at the start and in the years leading up to starting it I wondered if I might do it about collaborative improvisational practices um, or many different ideas um, but I ended up doing it around a sort of long-term solo dance making practice working with authentic movement um, as a kind of methodological inspiration or basis um, for forming and returning to movement content over a long period of time. But the first reason was to kind of rededicate myself to my own movement practice and discover that. So there was a kind of um, personal or selfish motivation there. But uh, alongside that, because I was working in higher education already and have been quite dedicated to the presence of dance and movement in education, in state education, you know, that it and that dance departments belong in education, it was finding a way to articulate um, or argue for even um, the value of dance and movement practices as holistic, as um, embodied. And so what I ended up doing was kind of using my own practice as a way to explore what uh, one instance of what that knowledge might look like. It's just one instance, one example, one artist's practice, but also making an argument, the kind of third reason, which became kind of more part of the PhD than I bargained for in the beginning, was making an argument for movement-based methodologies within academic research, um, and that those movement-based methodologies emanate from the uniqueness of an artist's practice, which hopefully also opens the door for lots of artists who work in lots of different ways yeah, in, yeah. in a range of practices yeah, yeah. to locate their practices within practice-based research. So that's kind of what opened up from it. And, and um, I suppose the practice of authentic movement itself holds a kind of reflective, ref reflexive quality that I'm also interested in in dancers and movers and sharing with dancers and movers mm. not least because it was such a transformative practice for me in the sense of moving opening to what's present and then reflecting on it afterwards and and sort of finding language for ineffable things you know it's impossible <laughs> to talk about movement but in trying to yeah we also bring it into conversation um, yeah yeah So in a way, authentic movement and my love for that practice was the kind of hook into the, those interests of moving and making and, and researching mm -hmm. through movement. Yeah, I really enjoy starting reading it. Oh. I feel like it, it can actually be quite helpful for maybe for various artists who want to explore their way of moving also and creating. Yeah, I mean, I think I think for everyone's different, you know, how mm. they how their creative process works. But what's important is to find out what 
you know, works for each of us in terms of, you know, making. And for me, there's a combination of those things, like time on my own, solitude is very important, but mm -hmm. also working with others or working alongside others, being seen um, in the process is also very important. They sort of go hand in hand. Um, I guess my wish for dance makers would be that that we there's lots of options to sample from so that we can sort of continue to grow and learn from each other's practices yeah. Yeah, and yeah. then offer our own back, you know, into the field as well. And then also our our tastes and preferences and creative needs change as life goes on too. I mean, how's <laughs> your how's your practice changing, do you think now? Mm, I I think I it feels a bit more selfish in a way that I think it's especially doing this podcast and inter interviewing some there's one with a dancer in Brussels Cassandre and she's very nerdy about her practice and she's really very obsessed with finding her way of moving and and then I realized that m my practice I, I was still a bit aware of how other people would see me moving and is it does it look good and and that would block it a bit I think and now I'm more into exploring my taste and really be just with the movement and mm -hmm. not in the thinking ahead on how it looks and am I improving or not and all these mm -hmm. thoughts that sometimes for me can be a bit coming around and blocking everything mm. Mm. so it's a nice mm. and I'm also exploring voice at the moment so oh wow which was very cool. yeah I've always because I'm a terrible singer and I've been told to <laughs> thank you I know but I really enjoy singing and I really blocked my voice for all these years mm. and I decided okay I sing very badly but also to learn to sing better you have to practice so mm. I'm doing this exploration and there's, I can't remember the name of this author, but a friend who is an actress, she gave me this book. Montageline, the book I mentioned is called Freeing the Natural Voice by Kirsten Linklater. I hope the pronunciation is okay and I will put this reference in the notes of the episode as always. I borrowed this book from my friend and actress Ellie Jordan, who I did interview in this podcast a few weeks ago. Check it out. And it talks about somatic practices and Alexander Technique and how, and I was like, wow, this is exactly the book I need to explore because I'm already connected to these practices and it really resonates. Mm. So this is another practice that mm. helps me. Mm. <laughs> and you, do you have one at the moment, something new that... Something new that's... Or? Yeah, this is, uh, in fact, what I asked you is what I'm asking myself, you know, a lot right now, which is, oh, yeah, how is my, you know, in a way, who am I now? Yeah. Uh, um, it's the last game of the... Uh, That's why I sold the people with this T-shirt? <laughs> it's the last game of the season. <laughs> I think it's a, and yeah, so it's a it, it's a very big game. It determines. Oh, There's a big. Okay. I hope you didn't want to watch it. No. Okay. I watched the women yesterday. I'm a Man City women mm -hmm. um, football fan. We have season tickets to the women's, and we went to their last game of the season at Aston Villa yesterday. So now I'm I'm more into the women than the men. <laughs> but, it is, <laughs> but it's a big game for the men. <laughs> That's what all the chanting outside. Um, yeah, I'm asking myself, yeah, how, how, who am I now? How am I making things now? Um, and I think it's like a very alive question. So sometimes I feel like I ha I'm sort of getting a handle on something like, oh, I think it's going to be this kind of process, or I think the work might have this shape. And other times I like really don't know. <laughs> and I think, wow, I just don't know. Yeah, so for example, I'm starting, well, have been starting a kind of new solo work stroke practice thing on and off as usual, you know, over the past year or two. And I've gathered a few images that I'm returning to. 
I start shaping something. I'm like, I don't, I don't want to do it like that this time. So, I, you know, I'm sort of hanging out with what wants to be formed now. And I, I think it sounds rather abstract what I'm saying, but I think I'm trying to both hold what I do know about how I might make something mm. as well as hold an open space of what I don't know yet about myself. And it's a little bit, it's fun. And and confusing. <laughs> so that's good that it's fun also. <laughs> you can find a balance between both. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If not balanced, then at least allow both. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And what do you feel is your strength as a human being? If you can mm. pick one thing that... It's the sort of thing you might answer differently, you know, at different... Yeah on different days or whatever. But I think today what came comes to mind is I think s sometimes I can really stay with something uh, for a long time and let it grow and evolve mm. and stay, you mm. know. So there's this kind of, it's a little bit like the previous point, like allowing consistency of relationship and change within that Um I'm not always like that, mm -hmm. but I think sometimes I can be. And I'd like, if I think about what, if what my asper and a that would be an aspiration of mine is that I can call on that capacity mm -hmm. when it's needed. Um, of course, I can't always, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and anything you would like to be better at? Of course, there's lots of uh, lots of things, but if I if I if I like think think about like yeah on the sort of yeah lifelong level, I'd like to be a bit better at confrontation ah. <laughs> when it's needed, uh -huh. when it's called for. Yeah, a bit braver. Maybe in general, I could say I'd like to be brave when I need to be brave and. Not always, you know, so like that's maybe in my, uh, I'm 51 now, so maybe in the second, my next 50 years, I'd like, <laughs> I'd like to be really get to the end of my life and be like, yeah, I was brave for my second 50 years. <laughs> <laughs> um, Do you find it easier as you grow older to find, because I hear a lot of people, they get a bit less scared at just being who they are and saying what they think. Mm. Especially women. I hear, listen to a lot of women speaking in podcasts saying that now that I'm 40, or even now that I'm 35, I feel like I'm a little bit more confident mm -hmm. in just saying. Mm. I suppose so. I suppose if, if what feels, maybe how I'd put it, is I feel like I can trust who I am mm. a bit more. Um which may or may not involve speaking out or speaking up, you know. Yeah. Um, but yes, that's certainly easier when I need to. Um, but there's a, it's an interesting thing with aging because I think it is true, You, it is possible. I, or I feel the possibility in me, like, oh, I trust myself more. Hmm. You know, all of the different parts of me. Um, but I think it also, it does bring forward or what I've noticed for my own process anyway, is that it's brought forward reflective processes that include regrets and mistakes made and mm. a kind of digestion of those things and really feeling things um, in relation to regrets and mistakes made and letting that be part of the process. But on the whole... This is a different point, but I just think I want to say I, I'm enjoying getting older. <laughs> that's nice. <laughs> is there anything that scares you? Yeah, a lot of things. A lot of things scare me. I guess on a, a global level, I'm scared of what we might do to each other um, and to the planet. Hmm. How about you? What are you scared of? 
Yeah, a lately planet, I think. And also seeing what I do and what I don't do. <laughs> I had a big bit of a shock listening to... I feel like living in London, sometimes you get a bit... It's very capitalist city and you work and you consume and... Hmm. Yeah, so I, I was listening to this podcast in French and in German. And I think especially in Germany, there is much more um, awareness of what's going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I realized that, yeah, in a way I'm scared not to do my best as a human being. So I think I want to change some things. Mm -hmm. so it's a good scare, I think. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and your strengths? Maybe my desires and curiosity and I feel like they keep me very alive and they make me want to do things and mm. to connect and in a way this podcast series is like an express one example of an expression of that isn't it? yeah yeah the, the desire for learning I feel like it's a very exciting one because you you can listen to podcasts, you can read books, and it's just, it's really feeding me in a way, and then it makes me want to do things, and it's just, mm. yeah, it's nice. <laughs> it feels good. <laughs> what type of artworks interest you, or books, or films, or what are you drawn to? Hmm. I think it's quite eclectic what I take in in terms of books and films and music and but there's one writer that I always read mm -hmm. her novels um her name is Louise Erdrich and she's a North American novelist has some Native American heritage and writes these gorgeous stories that become novels that always have a kind of fascinating um, set of people in them and but it's the way she writes that like is quite is concise and poetic and can hold emotion and beauty all together in the way she writes um, so it's like the content of the stories are incredible but it's also the way that she writes it mm. kind of gets really under my skin and creates a kind of atmosphere of specificity and openness makes me want to read it yes yeah. yes yes i really recommend i can give you some titles mm -hmm. um and so and uh, so sometimes you know I, i'll read like i can read a lot of different things or look at a lot of different things but sometimes when you see something and it's sort of it it's not only great it but it mirrors back some yeah you know aesthetic interests for lack of a better term for that so in, in her writing there's something in the how she does things uh, that is a sort of aspirational thing for me you know i'm not saying that's what i do so yeah um there's a folk singer that i always listen to her albums <laughs> over and over and over What's again. Her name? Laura Veers is her name. She's okay. based in now she's based in Portland and Oregon. And I love her songs. And uh, I'm not a songwriter or a musician, but if I could like come back and I just think it'd be such a cool art like thing to be able to do to write mm. songs and sing them and play the guitar and that's, that's what I'm learning. Is it? Oh, how amazing. I bought a guitar when I arrived in back in London, like in because I did a bit of traveling for the podcast. And one of the first things I bought a cheap guitar and yeah. Mm, oh, that's great. It's really hard though. Yes. I mean, I don't, I say that it would be wonderful to do it, but I don't think I actually have the discipline uh, to do it. But I really it's just nice. admire. Yes, exactly. You know, it's like. What a cool thing to like, make up a song and be able to, you know, I just And to think, be honest, even when I don't play good and I don't sing well, I feel good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I believe it. Are you writing songs like a, yourself? Well, it's kind of, it's very, very, the very beginning. Mm. Because I feel a bit limited with my vocabulary. Mm -hmm. So I'm also trying to read more like poetry in English. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I start to write very bad things, but 
it's it's also like I do journal, but very more like automatic writing, nothing. But it feels a nice way to try to make it rhyme or to just mm. find short sentences, and it's mm. been very therapeutic in a way mm. to do it. So I might try to explore that. Oh, great! Yeah. Oh, that's exciting. <laughs> Oh, I'd love to hear how that goes. You can, what, what's it like to, to you know, learn something from scratch like that? Because I, I take it you didn't know how to play the no. guitar before. No, no. I mean, I, I, we used to have a guitar with my brother and I would start to learn it, but always get a bit frustrated that it's, it's hard and it starts, doesn't sound so good. And I'm like, okay, no. But then this time I'm really like, okay, still, pra- I'm practicing. I try to practice every day when I'm not working too much. Mm. But I will update you to the where it's going. If you're an animal, which one would you be? Oh, well, I've got. Uh, I'm not sure, but I've got. I will admit that I've got a soft spot for otters. Um, Ooh, I just I love how they kind of move between land and water, and yeah. They need a lot of space. Like sliding. Yeah, they're quite playful, actually. Uh, and uh, they have, you know, they need space to roam. <laughs> so uh, I think I'd like to try it out, see what it was like. Uh, Some place where the water was clean. <laughs> <laughs> Be quick. <laughs> they, need, they need clean water. Yeah. And do you have a favorite color? Yeah. It used to be purple. I mean, I still love purple, but um, so that would have been my answer, you know. <laughs> but I'm not sure now. So X color. Yeah, it's my ex co- ex favorite color. I still like it, but yeah, it's my ex. <laughs> still have a good relationship. <laughs> we still have a good. We have we, yeah. How about you? What's your favorite color? Uh, it's li- like blue, but light blue. Yeah. Can be like the sky today. Oh, nice. Or like um, the sea in the south of France. Oh, nice. I love the sea. Animal? I'd like to be a bird, I think. To fly. To be able to escape situations whenever I want. (laughs) 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 And be like, okay, I'm I'm, I'm gone. (laughs) Goodbye. And what makes you happy? Mm. I think having time and space to play mm-hmm. gives me a sense of contentment, um, mm-hmm. which can include some happiness, you know. But yeah, having time and space to play with people and on my own, both. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And if you could meet your 15 years old self, Would you say something to her? Yeah, I would. I'm just wondering what it would be. Something along the lines of um, everything's going to be okay. Take your time. You know, take your time. Everything's going to be okay. And I'd want to put my hands like along her back and Mm. just give her sort of contact. Your back, back body. Hmm. When did you discover contact? The power of touch and... The touch, yeah. Um, probably late, later in life, kind of, I think, when I was doing that year at Laban. You had contact dance or just manipulation? Just it was just kind of a bit of hands-on work yeah. in some classes, but um, I know I've never really done a lot of contact improvisation. I mean, okay. huge respect for it as a form, and have done the odd class and workshop and stuff, but I'm not drawn to it as a mm-hmm. as a you know something I regularly do. But mm-hmm. I love working with touch yeah. and hands-on. Yeah, because you do one-to-one sessions, don't you? Yes, and it can involve some touch, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, so when I was, that year at Laban, when I was living with, with Regula, uh, we would sometimes give each other, she knew a lot more about giving hands-on, and so we would just offer each other hands-on, and sometimes mm-hmm. in classes, and then 
later I encountered it a bit more within the context of dance and then eventually and BMC sort of informed or body mind centering informed approaches to touch Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and I had a shiatsu practitioner I sometimes went to for touch started to in the maybe early 2000s I think and I just noticed my body needed it. Mm. And, and then later did this this training and working with it. I think my body still needs it. <laughs> <laughs> and, but it's, yeah. Uh, so that's a bit of a long answer, but it sort of got introduced. Yeah, it's interesting. And then, and then I, I found, gravitated towards it maybe more in my late 20s, 30s mm. to, to learn, actually learn more about it. Yeah. Hmm. How about you? Do you work with touch? I, yeah, I'm, I discovered, I think, working with Marina, especially, that my, my body is very, very, very sensitive. So touch is very powerful. And it was wow, like such a new world opening. And um, because I'm so sensitive, I really like to work with it, but in a specific way. Mm-hmm. I do really like contact improvisation, but it has to be very respectful and... Like, if someone throw the whole body at me or something, it can feel quite violent. So I do, I went to some jams and sometimes not didn't feel so comfortable. Mm-hmm. Sometimes felt great, depending on who I was dancing with. Mm-hmm. But I do definitely love touch. Mm-hmm. It's, yeah. yeah, even just a hug or <laughs> a good massage <laughs> can always appreciate. <laughs> And maybe last recommendation of something that you've seen recently or you heard or an exhibition or... I'm just thinking because there's lots of things. I'm just thinking things that in the last week, you mm. know, that... Um, yeah, so, so I, and this is, it's a little bit random because it's things I've encountered in the last week that have been, inspired me. Mm. Um one is I went to a one-day conference or symposium um, the University of Manchester on the Gospel of Mary Magdalene. Mm-hmm. And I went to this because there's a fellow artist and researcher who did her PhD at the same time as me named Joe Blake, who's a storyteller who works with like embodied processes and uh, emergent storytelling and she's done this just done this huge project on the gospel of mary magdalene and and made a piece of i mean i'd, I'd sort of call it dance theater actually storytelling dance yeah. theater and um i was i'm really inspired by how she works with these myths i don't work with myths or story in a direct way but i i love in hearing how she works something about it you know just uh, enters my imagination and I, I don't know to sort of make sense of it in my way yeah, um, yeah. but anyway um, what was it called the the heresy project that she did about the gospel of Mary Magdalene and I also listened to this podcast mm-hmm. on great women artists. I don't know. Have you, have you... Great women artists? Yes. I don't yeah. know it. I listen to a lot of podcasts in French for some reason. but This one is easy. I will, I'll send you the link yeah. or show you great in a speakers. moment. It's really good. It's this um, woman. She's a curator named Katie Hessel, and she interviews women artists and a lot of the time, sometimes I might have heard of it, and they're mainly in fine art, visual art, Mm. that domain and sometimes they work with performance or film or something but it's more that oh, wow. uh, you know tradition of, of or from that broad tradition you yeah. know and uh, but most of the time I haven't recognized the artist she interviews and um to discover new artists yes yes and like the way they talk about their art processes and things so I I listen to that whenever it comes out and sometimes it takes me in a, in a, you know, toward someone just to be encountering things. In terms, this is again, it's a bit, a bit random and eclectic. I love uh, random. <laughs> it's like what's uh, because what's, that's how we it works, right? The brain and everything is just. It's definitely how my brain works. Like I can just like hold on to the last week. So, I will say on the subject of women's football, mm-hmm. my favorite football player mm-hmm. is Lauren Hemm. 
Okay. And she's a winger for Man City Women. And although she's very fluid, she can play lots of positions. And I love thinking about how she plays because she's, um, she's really fast and fluid and strong. And she looks like she's having a good time. I mean, I'm sure she gets upset and frustrated <laughs> too. But I just love how she bounces back. And the kind of energy. and The energy of it. And I don't think I move that way or I'm necessarily like her. But I love watching her play <laughs> and something uh, of it. Uh, yeah. It inspires me. So yesterday I got to see Lauren Hemp play live. Wow. So she's, she's, her energy is really with me today. I don't watch football, but I will definitely check her out. Check out Lauren Hemp. Yeah. yeah. Maybe, maybe feminine football will be something that I could watch. Yeah, I was never into it until 2019. I remember the year because it was when I had to write my corrections for my PhD. And mm. I needed, I was like, I needed to find a source of energy. <laughs> and so I started watching women's football and it gave me this wow. energy and it gave me this uh, little bit of like, I could re-enter what I needed to say and mm. find the energy to push. Great. Yeah. So then I just kept, I was like, oh, I kind of like this. So I'll just keep watching it. So yeah. Well, oh, thank you so much. That was a great episode. Thank you so much for coming up to Manchester. And it's been really wonderful to meet you in the flesh. Yeah. And nailed on such a beautiful day. Yeah. Too. It makes it gorgeous. <laughs> yeah. If you enjoy this podcast, please give it a five stars on your favorite platform. It really supports me and then I can interview all the artists of the world until I die. Merci.